When Jim asked me to, uh, to talk about the British strawberry industry, uh, he asked me at the beginning of the year, and then uh, we had a, a referendum on the 23rd of June, and Brexit suddenly happened, Then he rang me up, he said, oh, would you also talk about Brexit? Okay. Then you had an election on the 8th of November, and I was waiting for the call to tell me to go and talk about Trump as well, but I'm, I'm glad to say that, that call never arrived. Okay, just very quickly about myself. Uh, I'm a fourth generation fruit marketeer, and there is a fifth generation in our industry as well, in our business as well, my son and nephew. Uh, I've been in the business for 47 years. I'm chairman, as Jim said, chairman of the largest fruit group in the UK. We turn over about $600 million. Uh, and I've been chairman of the uh, Industry Association Commission for nearly 14 years, uh, since uh, 2003. And I'm very lucky to be a non-exec director of various different companies which cover food service, farming, grocery, drinks, a whole range of different companies, uh, which, is, which gives me a marvelous view of the food industry. So just to give you a sort of talk about the, how we've done it in, in berries, and it's very interesting hearing the comments earlier on about the Mexican Avocado Commission, because we're in exactly the same position. The organization, I'm going to talk about the organization, give you some facts and figures. Uh, tell you in quite a lot of detail the PR campaign that we've run and give you some examples of those campaigns uh, and then talk a little bit about Brexit and then wrap it all up and try and do that in 45 minutes if not sooner. So British Summer Fruits, the organization, we, we founded in 1992 by a bunch of growers in the south of England. We are the soft fruit association for the UK. It's a voluntary membership but we represent 98% of the whole industry. So pretty much we've got everyone on board, and we have full and associate members. And there's a list there of the members, uh, or the major member companies. Mainly, they're the middlemen, marketeers, but we also have foreign uh, companies, and we also, as, as members, and also independent growers. As I said, 98% of the, of the industry is part of our association. Our annual turnover is, around about $430,000, $450,000, and each full member pays around about $550 for every $1.2 million worth of sales. And those sales are total sales, where it doesn't matter which, which source they come from. So what are the objectives of the organization? First of all, to run a year-round, 365-day campaign for berries. We don't care where they come from. All we are there for is to promote and expand our category. That is exactly the same as the, the Mexican avocados we, talked, we heard about earlier on. We collect and we disseminate uh, historic sales data on a weekly basis, so our members uh, know exactly by crop, by customer, uh, in week two, what happened in week one. Uh, we act as the industry spokesman and lobbyist, and I've been very busy doing that role for the last few months on Brexit. We have a crisis management program, which we have luckily not used too often, but it affects things like uh, labor availability, food, savers, food, food safety, and planning uh, for our, the structures that we use in our industry, and of course, uh, Brexit itself. We commission both scientific and market research. The scientific research, which you'll see a little bit later on, we use in terms of our PR. So we, we create some research, and then we use it to, to push the, the berry and consumption. And we have a direct relationship with every single supermarket in the UK. We don't give them money, but we give them facts. We have face-to-face -face meetings with them every year, myself and my team. And they are very involved in our business, in our industry. And as a reward, they give a shelf space, which is very important. And then we collaborate with overseas uh, exporters as well, particularly the Chileans who support our campaigns, but also uh, from Spain in addition. Sorry. So some facts and figures, just quickly. In value, our business has improved from, our industry has improved from just over 450 million pounds per annum to over one point, this year it'll be nearly 1.2 billion pounds. That's in sales, retail sales value. And you can see the growth. It's been uh, compound annual growth of over 8%. It's quite a story. And importantly, 
tonnage has gone up as well. We heard this morning, this afternoon, how important that is. It's not just value. People are eating more of our product, which is very, very important. So we hit nearly 200,000. We, we, we will hit 200,000 tons this year. If we look at it by the different gr crops, and we only re we're only talking about four crops now, strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, and blackberries. We don't cover anything else. We're not interested in anything else. So the growth, the real growth, and the success story of our industry is blueberries. Uh, 15 years ago, there were virtually no blueberries eaten in the UK. It was very much an American product. We introduced it, and my company introduced it, and it has pretty much pushed the category. Strawberry is still growing, but at a much shorter, slower rate. Raspberries stayed fairly static, but now with new varieties have suddenly taken off again, and the blackberry is a little bit of the orphan of the category. And as you can see, uh, strawberries have maintained their leading uh, volume. I mean, 65% of the, of the category now is strawberries. It was 83%. But you can see on that right-hand graph the growth of the blueberry and the growth of the raspberry. And, and that is a continuing trend. And this is the picture so far this year. Total berry increase this year is 12%. That you can put against the context of the fruit, of fruit itself, which is growing at a fairly slow 4 to 5 percent. So we are outperforming the, the rest of the categories, and more importantly, the 4 percent includes our 12 percent. So if you took out berries, it would look pretty low. And you can see the growth, particularly of the blueberry, in, in this year. This is a graph I'd like to hang on a little bit to, because I think it's quite important. Where ha who are the victims? Because I think as earlier someone said, you know, the, category, the total uh, eating of fruit is not that great. So who are the losers in this, in this game? Because we set out right from the word go to be the winners. We had to take business from, our, from other fruits. And I would imagine this is a similar story elsewhere. The big losers, apples, pears, bananas, grapes. And they continue to, we continue to take business from those categories. And the ones in the blue, that's us, the bigger ones. We keep growing. And that's our job. Our job is to increase our category. Simple as that. We don't care at whose expense. Our competitors are the other fruits. In terms of where the British uh, berry market has, has gone, we have the growers in the UK have, and that's the the figures in green, have raised their game and met the challenge of this increasing market. So even uh, 10 years ago, they represented about 44% of the total, and now they're still representing the same. So the market has grown, and growers have grown with it. We've got growers who 15 years ago were turning over maybe $70,000. They're now, not, now turning over 60 to $70 million, just single family businesses. So the industry, interestingly enough, is not attracting new people. There are no new growers coming into our industry. There are no new marketeers. So the growth has been, has been at the benefit of the players. There's no new players, which is very much different from the laws of economics. When you, when you read economics, you know, a market grows, people come in. No one's coming into our industry because the barriers to entry are so high investment and et cetera, et cetera. So this is interesting that the UK and the importers have, have maintained their share. And when you look at that split between the different crops, similar sort of, of situation, though obviously blueberries, very small volumes of blueberries grown in the UK, just that tiny little bit of green at the bottom there. It's mainly an imported business. The strawberry growers have increased their volumes, as have the raspberry growers. And the poor old blackberry growers are as I say, the orphans of the piece. Um, the supply structure has pretty much ch hasn't changed. We, the UK represents about 50% of all fruit, all berries consumed. And then Spain, in particular with strawberries, is our main source of supply. In raspberries, again, Spain, other than the UK, is our main source of supply. You won't see America there at all, barely at all, I'm afraid. Uh, in the outer season, we, we import from South America, from Chile, Argentine, Peru, and also South Africa. And that pattern, pattern is pretty much the same. Blueberry is the exception. There's virtually none grown in the UK. The big sources are Poland, Chile, and Spain. Blackberries, a little bit grown in Spain. Mexico is a, is a fair quantity, and the UK and the Netherlands. 
So what have we created? Well, we set out to, to stimulate demand. We wanted to, to push, we want the industry to be a demand push or demand pull uh, uh, industry and the supply following up behind, not the other way around. And, that, and we have achieved that. So what, what have we done to increase demand? Well, we fashioned very quickly onto the health benefits of our product. And it's not just health. We, fo we, we focus on health, beauty, and sex. And in any order you like, they, all, those, all those components seem to work. And our products are good in all those categories. You laugh, but it's true. Uh, and that sort of leads me on to the superfood status of our, of our fruit. We, we have made, and there are many claims to the benefits of blueberries and raspberries and strawberries, and we have ridden that particular uh, ride. We've also created more occasions for people to eat berries. Uh, in, in 15, 20 years ago, people ate berries around Wimbledon time. They used to pour cream on them. They put them in gattos. We've moved away from that. People are eating berries on every occasion, breakfast, lunch, dinner, at the office, as they're walking, snacking. There's a whole range of new occasions that people are eating our fruit, which is very important. It's a convenience product. In our business, in my own business, we, have worked, we worked out quite a long time ago the fruits to concentrate on were the ones you could eat and walk at the same time. You can eat and walk berries, and you can eat and walk uh, satsumas and such like. We hit that particular category. So it's very, con very convenient. It's a convenient product. We don't wash it. We can eat it straight away. Also, the consumer has changed in the last five, 10 years. They are buying more frequently. They're not buying the, 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 so much as a once a week purchase. And that suits our product, because in a once a week shop, if they buy berries, they finish them in two days. And then for five days, they've got no berries in their, in their fridge. They've got no berries in their table. But now they're, eating, they're buying every day. The convenience stores, big thing in the UK. I think it's the same over here. And they're buying online. So these increased number of shopping occasions has benefited our product. And because of our relationship with the supermarkets, we've got increased shelf space. You know, we've created a virtuous circle. And it, shelf space is absolutely key. We don't pay for it, but you get, you get the shelf space by the promotions and by the virtuous circle you create. And that shelf space is limited, and we get it at the, at the benefit or the sacrifice of other categories. And we have a year-round PR campaign, which I will touch on in a minute. What have the growers done following this demand pull? Well, surprisingly, not surprisingly, they've increased their acreage significantly, and they've increased their yields. They've extended their seasons. They're now growing berries in the UK and Europe in glass houses. Glass houses that were used previously for flowers, for plants, for products that had gone down, we started buying, our industry started buying and, and increasing our sales through buying old glass houses, and now they're putting up new glass houses. So our extension now, our season now is nine months in the UK. It used to be six weeks. New varieties, a lot of new varieties, a lot of work by the marketing companies on um, improving the quality of our product, increasing its yields, improving the, the flavors, and that has obviously improved the, the benefits to the consumer, hence the reason why they've bought more. We in the UK, we expected, we in the middlemen, expected to manage the category for the supermarkets. We get the data straight from the, super, from the, from the till in, in the stores. We analyze that data and we show the supermarkets, that's our job, to how to uh, manage the category. They don't do it themselves. They look to their marketeers and suppliers to do that work. And of course, the growers, and I said the, the higher entry levels, have invested heavily in, in tunnels, in new growing methods, in glass houses, et cetera. So there's been a lot of investment in our industry and a lot of production innovation, which has meant that yields have gone up. They've had to go up because prices have been relatively stable. OK, PR, our PR campaigns. Our money, as I said, we, we have an income, the association has an income of about 350,000 pounds. We spend about 300,000 dollars on an annual, on our continual PR campaign. That is mainly money spent 
paying for the PR agency. Two thirds of it is for the agency. And the, the, um, the campaign is a continual, the red line is the continual story we send to the, we give to the consumer 365 days a year. And then we run three, two to three boosting campaigns during the season, be it winter or summer. And I will highlight some of those campaigns. As I said to you before, we've shifted the consumer from strawberries and cream, strawberries and gatto, into other uses for berries, smoothies, other occasions, and created a, a demand that the consumer didn't realize they wanted. We've shifted our campaigns, our news, from just announcing the start of a season to a whole range of different campaigns to stimulate the consumer, to get them working and thinking about our products. So a typical summer campaign, when we ran about two or three years ago, the, the, the strap line was strawberries say summer. We wanted to, to engender the, the smell of strawberries and what people thought about when they thought about strawberries. And they thought about cutting the lawn, they thought about tennis, so there was a whole range of things they did. So we commissioned the University of London to come up with some sensory research just to see how consumers linked their, their thoughts and their senses with strawberries. We then got a taste expert, a chef who, who could create dishes around that sensory, and then we, we created a multi-sensory experience, and we did that in conjunction with Marks and Spencers, and we got a whole load of, uh, of uh, news just around this link between how strawberries smell and the effect it has on the consumer. M&S were very, that's one of our major retailers, very kind to us. They let us have the whole of their, their flagship store in central London, and we created a mountain of strawberries. We had strawberries that talked to you. We had uh, the smell of strawberries coming across the store. Everything was strawberries. This was for a week, and it was a fantastic experience. And obviously, we, we weren't worried about increasing the number of strawberries bought by M&S. We wanted the story. We wanted it read. And it did, it got tremendous coverage. And that was the result of that coverage in uh, that, that stunt, because these are stunts in M&S. And these are all major um, national uh, newspapers. The other area that we've spent a lot of time on is foodies and bloggers. This is the, we talked about the young generation. We actually haven't thought about the Z generation. We're concentrating on the, the sort of 20s to 30s, the, the, the consumer who is really keen on uh, scratch cooking using our product. And we have a, a very big outreach program with bloggers. And I've been to some of these blogging events, and they're, they're people who have got day jobs who are very keen on cooking and using, using uh, all sorts of ingredients, and then they go away and they blog our products to tens of thousands of readers. And it's a very, very price efficient way of getting your message across. So I'll just give you some examples of three campaigns that we ran, and they, they, we ran recently, which, uh, and the effects they've had. The first one was called Snack Smart, and we, did, we had some research done by a university in the UK called Loughborough, and it was basically to see if people snacked berries at work on a, on a daily or weekly basis, how would it affect their weight? And this was a very uh, key piece of research. And we found that people would lose a pound, the consumer would lose a stone in weight if they stuck to a, a snacking uh, campaign. We didn't expect them to try it, but it sure as hell got some stories. And that, these are stunts. The next one, uh, that, th those were the stories we got, the coverage we got. Uh, from the Snack Smart, Smart campaign. We had a, a very famous uh, UK um, DJ to, to sponsor it, to ambassador it, uh, and it was a very effective campaign. It got us, as you can see, three million pounds worth of, uh, of uh, readership, of advertising, uh, and it gave us a return on investment of one pound to every 87, or 87 pounds for every one pound we spent. Very effective campaign. The next one, was Eat Smart, called Eat Smart. And this was led by a, a very famous food blogger in the UK, Madeleine Shaw, who we ran blogging events. And again, very, very useful. She's a well-followed blogger and writer. 
again, we, got reach, we reached 17 million people uh, with an advertising equivalent of 2.4 million. And again, a return on our investment, every pound we spent, we got 75 pounds worth back in advertising equivalents. Really good return. But the winner has been berry brainy. We, um, we found some research that showed that eating berries improved your concentration at work. And I think you can see there, if you hope you can, is we, had, we created, we, we built a, a brain in the center of London. And we covered the brain with, it's covered with uh, punnets, packs of blueberries, strawberries, etc. And we had the brightest TV presenter in the UK, a woman called Rachel Riley, to front it. She was not only the brightest, she was also the best looking. And we had, it was a great stunt. It got enormous amount of coverage in, our, in the daily press. And at the end of the stunt for the day, all the consumers could take away a punnet. So it was, we, we managed to move all that fruit as well. That's the coverage we got from uh, Berry Brainy, and we're going to use that this winter as well in another sort of way. And again, we, there we got a return of 142 pounds for every pound spent, generating coverage, improving demand the whole time, and sucking that demand through to the uh, through the supply chain. So how do we see the outlet? Well, we believe we've created a virtuous circle, one that can be copied by any category. I believe, in any country. Very, very simple. Concentrate on the category, ignore the rest, don't worry about generic campaigns, get the industry behind you, and you can create this virtual, virtual circle of um, suppliers, support, uh, su suppliers pooling their resources and supporting you, um, getting demand up, and getting consumers to respond to the campaign. And in that way, we we believe that's one of the main reasons why we have done so well on this particular category. So that's my story on, on berries. I hope it's, it is or can be applicable to other categories in this country and elsewhere. Now, as I said, Jim asked me to touch on Brexit. I think Brexit, for those who aren't aware, in two years' time will be coming out of the EU. It's the biggest market in the world, 500 million people, uh, 28 should certainly soon to be 27 countries, and we have this, taken this decision. Lots of similarities between what we've done and what you've done in this country in terms of uh, moving away from the traditional uh, pattern of trade. It, it, we have three things which is going to affect us, and it could also be similar things here. The labor availability, our ability to bring in labor to pick our crops, uh, membership of a customs union, namely the single market, so it's no different from EFTA and all the other uh, uh, customs unions that you have or were about to, to, uh, to be, become members of. NAFTA, not sorry, NAFTA, not EFTA. Uh, we're, we're members of the single market, and also we receive funding from the EU. And the, I'll just quickly touch on how this will affect the UK and our industry particularly. So labor availability, we in the software industry, we employ 31,000 seasonal workers every year. The UK uh, citizens do not like to come and pick our crops, no different from you or Canada or Australia. We have to bring in uh, workers from the EU, from Poland, from Czech Republic, from Bulgaria, etc. They represent 95% of our workforce. So without them, we're absolutely sunk. And as I said, very few UK citizens want to do that work. 70% of these workers come back every year. There's a dis disinclination now due to our pound being devalued and the fact that they feel unwelcome that they will come back, which is a big problem to us. We've had the devaluation of sterling, so our workers, their remittances back to their home countries are reduced by that amount. And there is an anti-immigrant feeling in the UK, which is really disappointing to see and experience. And the government, and I've had meetings with the highest level other than Prime Minister, but at Secretary of State level, will not give us any assurances of where our labor is going to come from in two years' time. So it's a real worry to, uh, to our industry. One little bit of good news, we did actually, the Secretary of State yesterday in the House of Parliament did say that uh, seasonal workers, she may consider it, but we've got no, absolutely no guarantee whatsoever. No, no labor, no industry. So all the good stuff I showed you before may, be, may come to naught. Uh, if we don't have people to pick our crops. It's a real worry. And as I say, acute uncertainty as a result. 
membership of the single market, we're not big exporters of berries, but we do import a lot of berries from, from Spain, as you saw. We also import our plants. Um, most of the, a lot of the strawberry plants are grown in Bulgaria. Um, we, ex oops, sorry. we export plants to, the, to Europe. Uh, at the moment, there are no borders, no ta there's no tariffs, there's no controls. All that will change. When we, when we leave Europe, there will be border controls, there'll be tariffs. The, the whole job of importing will become much more difficult, and it will become a logistical nightmare. I mean, if you could imagine trying to bring in Californian strawberries across the states and having to stop every single state to pay a tariff or to, um, to have your product inspected, that's what's going to happen to us. It's a likely effect, where at the moment we can bring a truck of strawberries in from Spain and there's no delay whatsoever. And finally, we get, a, we get a fair amount of funding from Europe, around about $50, $50 million, to help our business, help our industry. And that, again, it could very well be curtailed. And that money goes on capital projects, doesn't go on subsidizing the crops. And we match this money by, from, the, from the growers. So again, the res and the result of that money has meant that we've become very self-sufficient. These, these funds have been guaranteed till 2020. And after that, who knows what's going to happen. So, in conclusion, I think, I've, I think I've shown to you that the UK soft food industry is highly successful. One pound, uh, in every five pounds of money spent on the fruit, on fruit, a over a pound is spent on berries. We represent 22% of the basket. It's a tremendous success story. We've created this virtuous circle. Brexit is without a doubt causing us a great deal of uncertainty. Trump's policies on climate control, customs union, unions, and immigration could have a global effect, and we're concerned about that. We don't know what they are, but they could, it could have an effect on us. But our business strategy is to stay focused, to concentrate all the time on the consumer, to innovate, and not to get complacent. And I'd like to thank these two organizations that helped me, our PR company, Red Brick Road, and also a, a data and analytics company called uh, Fresh Forecast. And I'd like to thank Jim. Thank you very much indeed, and good luck. Dr. Uh, Adal uh, Hussain, World Liberty TV Food and Wine Channel. Thank you for an excellent presentation. Now, you mentioned the uh, Brexit uh, possibilities of what could be uh, happening and how it can impact your industry. Now, thinking a little forward, what is your game plan? Are you thinking already as an alternative how are you going to carry on without the funding and the other ideas? Have you put a plan together with your board, or, or are you just waiting to see what happens and then take action, sir? It's very difficult to put a plan together when you don't know what is, is around the corner. I mean, I, I liken Brexit, and, and I'm sure, I think some of you might be able to manage it. Brexit is like you're living in a house, and there's a house around the corner a mile away which is up for sale and you decide you're going to sell your house and move into the house around the corner, and you've never seen it. We have no idea what that house is going to look like. We don't know whether it's got windows, whether it's got doors, whether it's on a main road. We do not know anything about that house. So it's impossible to plan to decorate that house. We know we're going to move away from our one, but how can you decorate the new house when you don't even know what, anything about it? And that is the analogy I've got about Brexit. We can't make plans. What I can tell you is that the best UK growers are buying land in Europe and further afield in South Africa and, and Australia and are, and are putting businesses over there. They're moving their techniques, they're moving equipment, and they're putting, the, I mean, there's, there's growers uh, exporting their businesses to, to Spain. They obviously can't export their land. They're putting businesses in, in, in France, in Poland, and that is going to be, that is happening. I'm seeing that already. But as, as to making exact plans, no, we're busy lobbying government to make sure, sure those three things don't happen, that we do have labor. So that's what we're doing at the moment. Um, part of the, you mentioned was to, that uh, your, your program promotes all berries of all origins. You don't distinguish between... We don't between care where they come from. You don't care, and you don't even say, and um, very different than many of the... Um, I just wanted to make sure on that. No, no, we, we, we couldn't care less where they come from. Our campaign is called Seasonal Berries. We have, we, we, uh, as far as we're concerned, we want people to eat berries. If they eat them from Mexico or England or France or Poland, we don't care. What we do do is we tell them what berries are in season. 
And that's how we've got money from the Chileans, we've got money from, from the Spanish to support their berries, and we manage that money for them. It's, it's managed by myself and our PR agency. So it's a continual one stream of information, one place that the press and the media and TV and radio, they know where to go when they want a story about berries, they know who to talk to. Fine, I'd answered like everyone. To... I'd like to ask a question, actually. In the U.S., uh, there have been many efforts on many commodities to bring people together in voluntary boards. Um, almost always they have failed because, um, I guess what economists would call the free rider problem, where some, some significant portions of the industry have said they didn't want to contribute. Um, you seem to have been able to overcome that. Yep. To what do you attribute that? Well, because we're not generic. I mean, I've been a contributor to a generic campaign, and there are free riders. And, and after two or three years, you say, well, why are we doing this? Why are we paying for this when him over there and him over there isn't, isn't contributing? So they always fail. Complete waste of time. A category campaign, you know exactly who the free riders are. And believe me, I spent a lot of time recruiting those free riders. And the best recruiting sergeant is the supermarkets. Because I go around the supermarkets and I say, Look, your grower or your supplier is not contributing to our campaign. That is totally wrong. And when they hear that, they then put pressure on the grower. And they say to the grower, if you want to supply us, you've got to join British Summer Fruit. It's against the, probably the Monopolist Commission and everything else, but it works. Hence the reason we've got 98% of it. But you, you have to use every hook and crook to get them in. But it's much easier on a category campaign than it is on a generic campaign. It's pretty much impossible. And also, the message is much more focused, because you can see the results. I mean, I bring growers in, and I brought growers in, but they can see the results. Their business, businesses have improved, so why wouldn't they join? And of course, when I go around to the supermarkets, what I haven't said is, I show them the slides of who the members are, and the best slide is the slide which shows who aren't the members. And no one likes to have that slide in front of a supermarket. And that's how you get them in. Shame them. Back there. So in your presentation, you stated that um, sales, really, you didn't um, increase overall consumption. You just increased consumption for your categories. I'm not paid to increase the consumption. For no, and, and I don't blame you, believe me. So the question is, what do you think is going to happen in the future? And I know Brexit's going to step on that because everyone's kind of tied up with that as, as opposed to thinking about their own marketing programs right now. But what do you think is going to happen in the future f with categories like, you know, you, you mentioned a couple of categories like the apples and pears, and I believe you said grapes. Do you think those people are going to learn from your example and then start programs similar to yours to try and grab some of that consumption uh, percentage back or gr try and grow the overall number? Do you see that in the future? I have been buying, I mean, everyone knows that they have been victims to our campaign, so it's not new news. And I have businesses in the apple and pear business, in the apple and pear industry, I've got a business in the, in the citrus business, so on the one hand, I'm pushing one category, and I see the balance sheet of my other companies going down the tube. But that, you know, that's, how, that's what life is. It's, very, it's interesting, the cherry industry, uh, under our, our, my guidance, is now going for a 12-month campaign, or 10 months, because they haven't got 12 months of cherries. So they are now bringing in money. This, this year is the first year. There'll be Chilean money and Spanish money improving the cherry industry. Now, previously, the cherry campaign was only UK-based. And in 2017, it's going to be funded and pushing, the same way as we do, seasonal, it's going to, funny enough, they've copied us, seasonal cherry campaign, all sources, and they don't care where it comes from, the money is, and the money will be raised on both imported and UK sales, exactly the same as us. I have banged the drum to the Apple industry, saying, why are you not doing the same as us? They have a campaign to promote British apples, but, and, and yet we get apples from all around the world, and it's crazy. But unfortunately with campaigns, this sounds a bit big-headed, you have to have someone to lead it. And if no one is prepared to stand up and be that person, then it won't happen. And I think that's one of the key ingredients. I didn't say it because I'm too modest, but that is the key ingredient. Someone has to do the job. And, the, you know, people don't want to do it. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Thanks. Thank you so very much. Pleasure. Thank you.